Here's what uh, Bexley Heath Council uh, had to say. Go on, you, you say it. OK, yeah. there is a large cubicle provided at the Tynley Road toilet. That's where you go. And a universal mm. superloo close by with enough space for a parent and child together. Very spacious. I might pop in there myself. Mm -hmm. And there are nearby toilets at Central Library. If you've got something you want to get mm. off your chest, then uh, do tell us about it at uh, bbc.co.uk slash the one show. You've got a strong view on ladies' cubicles? <laughs> well, only that there are not <laughs> enough of them, especially in theatres. You know, that's the one point, p place you do not want to get recognised, and that's in the, in the queue for the loo, you know, because yeah. <laughs> you're kind of trapped. You can't go anywhere. You know? So you're so well, grateful to be in the cubicle. But... You're not bothered about its size when you, <laughs> no, when you, no. when you get in Just there. More lose, I would say. I mm. don't mind how big they are. We've seen your uh, Elizabeth I uh, costume uh, mm. here. Mm. Yeah, I think it could be problems going to the loo there. Oh, that. yes, absolutely. <laughs> Except, you know, underneath you don't wear very much. And oh, don't spoil <laughs> it for us. <laughs> Imagining limitless corsetry down there. It's very weird wearing those kinds of dresses because you don't feel anything around here, so you feel sort of naked from the waist down. You've got all corsets and everything up here, but from the waist down you can't feel anything. Your legs are, like, completely free. So I like it. It's quite nice. Rather <laughs> nice. I might try it myself. Um, <coughs> now, you were in theatre for an awful long time um, to critical acclaim and everything, but not particularly well known because of it. Because because well, stage... Shakespeare, you don't yeah. sort of get. You know, was it easier? Was it easier like that? Not being that well known. Uh, <coughs> no, because you know I was young and I was very. Um, keen to be a good actress and I was learning and very self-critical and you know you're in agony all the time because you think you're not good enough. Yeah. So it's the guard dogs, they knew you were in. Who let the dogs out? Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it was harder in a way and as you get older you sort of get a bit more chilled about things, a bit more relaxed. So you're better off being famous at your age rather than as a very young woman? Oh, I think that would be very difficult. I feel very sorry for these, you know, high-level Hollywood starlet people yeah. being followed around. I think that must be absolutely impossible. Yeah, but you became a household name very much with Prime Suspect, of course, I did, which yes. I look back on so fondly now. I mean, it must have been an incredible part of your career, I suppose, really. Like it was, that. you know, it took a lot, uh, you know, I did it over a long period of time. Mm. It was, it became an iconic sort of television yeah. character. And, uh, of course, it was fantastic for me, but, um, you know, all good things have to come to an end, and I, I felt it was time to sort of move on from it. Mm. Yeah. Um, and there's a, we've got another play here from, I think, mid-70s, yeah. 74, 74, 5. Um, you, are you much of a singer, Helen? It's from a... I can't sing. Right. I can't sing at all, as okay. my husband well, knows. Let's, have, let's um, have a little look. We can put that to the test. It's a BBC play <laughs> called uh, Teeth and Smile. Oh, my God. As you leave the tailpipe in your second-hand motor car Check your mirror and you overtake your truck Oh, well, it's a humiliation tape of <laughs> all time. We thought time. you were playing the part of somebody who, who couldn't sing. The thing was, I can't sing at all. I can't hold a note, as you could tell, hold a tune or sing a note or anything. Um, but I learnt in that, in doing that play, that you can kid the audience into believing anything. And because I did it with, uh, you can almost see it there, with such a sort of personal conviction. I am singing really, really well at this moment. <laughs> I'm a good old rock chick. Yes, yeah. I can. <laughs> <laughs> but you sort of convinced. Yeah. The audience yeah. of, of the this is a real purpose it. the way you're doing it. I love yeah, it. a real purpose. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> God, you are oh, cruel. Yeah. I know we're embarrassing yeah. her now. We'll move on. We'll yeah. leave that. It's time to recover. <laughs> Makeup, please. Just we need to yeah. fan Dame Helen down a little yeah. bit. <laughs> Aspiring. <laughs> This week on The One Show, members of our team are choosing their best times to be British. Yesterday, our wildlife man, Mike Dilger, went for Darwin and the Victorian age of expiration. Today, Christine Walkden transports us back to the early 1600s to learn about Britain's first celebrity gardener. Britain is home to 15 million gardens, and tending them is a national obsession. But until the 1600s, they lacked the exotic variety of plants we take for granted today. Then came along two extraordinary plant collectors known as the Tradescants, who were to change the face of British gardening forever. John Tradescant had become one of the head gardeners at Hatfield House in Hertfordshire in 1610. Newly built at the time, Hatfield was one of the most fashionable residences in the land. 
home to the wealthy and powerful Robert Cecil. A man of extravagant taste, he insisted his gardens match the grandeur of his new home. Cecil wanted the very finest plants and commissioned Tradescent to travel overseas only to bring back the rarest and most exotic for his garden here at Hatfield. It was the beginning of a career of plant hunting adventures that would turn Tradescent into a celebrity gardener of his time, as garden historian Jennifer Potter explains. So where did Tradescent go to impress his boss? When he started working for Cecil, he went over, first of all, to the Low Countries in France, where he went on this wonderful plant buying spree. He then, um, later on, made a couple of even more extraordinary journeys. Travel in those days was actually quite difficult. You couldn't simply, well, hop on a plane. So uh, what he used to do was to hitch a ride on other people's expeditions. Fantastic! He sailed as a gentleman volunteer with the British fleet into uh, the Mediterranean against the Barbary pirates. Wow, so quite a character. <laughs> Absolutely extraordinary. And in between bouts of fighting, he would um, get off onto the islands and go looking for plants. And he brought his finds back here to create a magnificent garden at Hatfield House. I've got here a copy of one of his bills from 1611. Um, and you can see, well, it's rather hard to read the writing, but fig trees, um, oleander, wow. myrtles, um, there's and a... Gilly flowers there, see? There's a pot of orange trees. These are all rare exotic plants. His garden at Hatfield was a sensation, and Tradescant's green fingers were soon in high demand. In 1630, King Charles I even made him his royal gardener. His fame quickly spread. Tradescant was at the centre of this network of plantsmen and, and curious gardeners around Europe. And he was receiving a lot of plants from sea captains, from all these other people. And that's how Tradescantia, uh, the plant that was named right. after him, came. And they've got some here in the garden. John Tradescant's son, also called John, followed in his footsteps travelling even further afield to recently colonised America on the hunt for more new plants. We know his father was growing something like 700 different varieties of plants, and the son added a 1,000 wow. to that list. They included trees of the English landscape, the, the red maple, the American sycamore, yeah. the tulip tree. Yes. And they helped to communicate this great excitement about plants. And I think, um, you know, the British remain enamoured of their plants. And I think it's why we're a nation of gardeners. But until recently, the Tradescants' contribution was largely unrecognised and their grave at St Mary's Church in Lambeth neglected. The Tradescants' tomb lay totally overgrown until 1977, when it was rediscovered by two keen gardeners who turned St Mary's into the Garden History Museum. At its heart is a garden full of beautiful flowers which the Tradescants would have grown. An apt memorial to two men who started the golden age of British gardening. Let's see if we can conjure Christine Walkden back <laughs> from the early 17th century. But there she disappeared into it a couple of days ago. Ah, oh, what a relief. <laughs> the time warp. <laughs> now, this John, uh, John, what's the name? Tradescan. I've never yeah. heard of him, but I'm his biggest fan now. He it, started it all off. He started gardening. He did, and he was such a charismatic figure, and he introduced lots of garden plants that nobody had ever seen before. So the first time this guy comes into the country yeah. just bulging with fantastic plants and runs with it. So what are you, a serving maid, serving <laughs> wench? Oh, no, what? no, I'm a very sophisticated flower seller. Oh, yeah. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> She's responsible, so. Christine, yeah. for bringing us these. Well, indeed, so you've got things like the orange, which is beautiful, yeah. and we now take it for granted, but Tradescant was one of the first people to bring this into the country. Myrtle and a lot of the other spices, etc. He had and he introduced, and, of course, Tradescant here, the plant itself that was named.